My name is Simon and this is how to build a racing car. The suspension on an Australian Formula V racing car is totally unlike what you will find on pretty much any other racing car out there. It's taken straight from the old Herbie style Volkswagen Beetle and is the complete opposite of modern. I consider it actually one of the class's biggest strengths. It's such a limiting factor to the car's performance that no matter what you do with the rest of the car, it will be limited by the suspension, making all cars on the grid relatively equal. This I think is a big part of why Formula V can have so many different car manufacturers competing on such an even playing field. There are some things which can be done however, and that will be the focus of this episode where I'll show you how I optimise my car's vehicle dynamics. The front suspension uses an H-beam with trailing arms connecting the wheels. The upper beam contains a number of torsion leaves which are held static at the centre by an adjuster and are connected to the trailing arms on their outer ends. When the wheel moves up and down it twists the leaf pack which provides the springing for the car. The rules allow you to remove leaves to change the spring rate but it's already about as soft as you could possibly want it. The ride height of the car is controlled by an adjuster in the centre. Changing the angle of this changes the effective preload on the springs and so the ride height of the car. The bottom beam contains an anti-roll bar which connects the left and right hand wheels. When one moves the anti-roll bar tries to move the other as well. How much is controlled by the stiffness of the anti-roll bar? The car does use push rods but these are only used to actuate the dampers. Since the front spring rate is pretty much set, the first thing I did was just measure it. I did this by loading the sprung trailing arm with known masses and measuring how much it deflected. This gave me the front spring rate. It will be extremely difficult to calculate this accurately, so measuring it directly was very simple in comparison. I was also hoping to reuse the anti-roll bar that came with the wreck that I bought. Calculating its stiffness was quite simple just based on its diameter, length and material. The rear suspension design is much more free, so apart from having to use the axle tubes I could do pretty much what I wanted. There are three things I was really aiming for. I wanted to have as much independent control over heave, roll and camber as possible. Heave would be accomplished by transferring the vertical suspension loads onto two springs side by side. These would be in turn mounted to the chassis on a rocker. If the car moves, the rocker would turn, maintaining approximately equal load across both wheels. Most Formula V cars in Australia accomplish this by using a single spring between two rockers on the rear. There is an improvement that can be made however. This design provides no way to control the roll of the car at the rear. Hence two more springs can be added to the outside beside the heave springs. These control the rotation of the rocker, effectively providing control over the rear roll stiffness. I can't take credit for this layout by the way, it's identical to another car in Australia called the Checkmate, widely considered to be the best Formula V in Australia at the moment. That's two of the three aims I had down. Third, I need to control the rear camber. The wheels on a Formula V connect directly to the end of the axle tubes with no universal joint. This means that when one wheel moves up or down, it changes the angle as well. A consequence of this is that the car's rear roll centre is very high. This induces quite severe jacking at the rear of the car as it goes around a corner. Effectively the forces imparted on the car by the wheels force the rear upwards as it corners and this leads to a positive camber due to the axle tubes. This is very bad for getting any grip out of the tyre so it must be controlled. To do this, a camber cable is typically used in Australian Formula V. This simply prevents the two wheels from drooping too far while still allowing them to droop independently as a consequence of roll. I opted for a cable running from the bell cranks over a pulley to perform this function. A guide will be necessary to prevent the cable from coming out of the pulley when it's unloaded. This gives us the three controls I really wanted for the rear of the car. That about covers the main considerations. There was also the question of controlling the longitudinal movement of the wheels. I used leading arms here so that I could connect them to the chassis closer to the centre than would be possible with trailing arms. This would reduce the change in toe angle with bump or roll. These leading arms would use two members, one connecting to the axle at the main outboard mounting plate, with the other connecting to the offset mount below. This would allow the leading arms to be triangulated, reducing the member sizes. These will be taking quite a lot of force, particularly under braking, so the assemble needs to be very strong. They connect to a large rod end at the rear to allow them to pivot up and down. We need one more crucial set of information. The weight of the vehicle and how it's distributed. I know the mass of the vehicle, it's defined in the rules as 500 kilograms or above. My car may weigh less but I'll just have to add lead to it to bring it up to that mass if it's underweight. 
To find the distribution of mass front and rear, we stuck the car on a steel bar and rolled it forwards and backwards until the car was perfectly balanced while I was sitting inside it. I measured how far the bar was from the rear wheels and I was able to work out the weight distribution from that. Finally, the unsprung masses were measured directly using a set of scales. From a vehicle dynamics perspective, it's important to know how much of the mass is unsprung, that is, things like the wheels and brakes that don't have suspension between them and the ground, and sprung masses, which is things like the, well, rest of the car that is supported by the springs. With all of that in place, now we need to look at the actual vehicle dynamics. There wasn't any tyre data available for the Hoosier tyres that we run, which meant that I couldn't delve too deeply into looking at the car's handling characteristics. I stuck therefore to a few simpler methods that could be used on this car without that tyre data. As I mentioned, the front was pretty much fixed, which really simplified things for me greatly. It meant I was focused totally on getting the rear to work well with the front. In order to do this, I built a spreadsheet in Excel that would allow me to input all of the points describing the car physically. Pivot points, suspension mounts, wheel centres, that sort of thing. And then I added in functionality that allowed each of the pivoting points to be moved. As the length of the joining members was known, I could check the resulting length of each member after a rotating pivoting point was moved, and compare the difference and determine a new angle for the pivot. In this way I was able to run through a number of steps within the spreadsheet, eventually finding the new positions iteratively. While it might sound complicated, there were relatively few different equations used to perform all of this, mostly relying on vector algebra to handle movement and rotation in three dimensions. I started working from the base static case with all of the forces generated by the springs with a set preload. I also set the pitch, roll and vertical position of the car. From this the spreadsheet calculated all of the positions and forces within the members. When I had the suspension design nailed down, I'd then be able to use the maximum forces to calculate the sizes of the suspension members that I needed. With all of that together, I was finally able to start getting some useful results. I could find the effective wheel spring rate, which coupled with the sprung masses allowed me to calculate and optimise the car's response to disturbances, uh, such as going over curbs or bumps. I could find the front and rear roll stiffness, which would allow me to find the car's roll stiffness distribution front to rear. This could be used to tune how it responds at the limit, be it understeer or oversteer. I could find how much the car would pitch or roll when braking, accelerating or cornering by using the data I have from my time racing previously as a guide for maximum longitudinal and lateral acceleration. Using all of this, plus a lot of time optimising, I was able to find my desired spring rates for the rear springs to achieve the targets that I set. So ultimately, while I was limited by not having any tyre data available, I believe I found a pretty decent benchmark for my car. I don't expect it to be perfect right out of the gate, but what it will do is get me closer to a decent solution from the beginning, reducing how much time I need to spend optimising the setup by testing at the track, which would obviously be a much costlier and less time efficient solution. Anyway, that was a brief overview of how I arrived at the suspension design that I've got. As always, I'd love to hear your feedback, so feel free to leave a comment with your thoughts. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you on the next one.